This is a report on our 1983 mission to the U.S. Congress. It might be titled, Ministers to Ministers. And I'm going to give a rather brief report, and then we will give a demonstration or an example of what we say to the men in the congressional offices and how we present the material and so on, along with some scriptural reasons as to why we go to men in civil government. For years, I've been going to the U.S. Congress every uh, year and spending two weeks down there. In the last few years, we've had eight men in the crew every time. And I've been urging others to go to state legislators and to go to their mayors and their councilmen, county commissioners, and people in civil authority all over the United States with the Word of God, with Bible law, and tell them some of the things that they know out of the Bible. Now, I'm obviously not going to be able to tell you a whole story of everything that happened in two weeks down there. We were in about 250 offices in the House and the Senate talking to someone in those offices, either the congressman, in case we couldn't talk to him, we talked to an aide, and left this uh, loose-leaf binder that we have down here. This will be a typical presentation, however, it will be brief, and it will not be like all of them, because in some cases we're in there five minutes if we get no response or a little bit of antagonism, and other times we'll be there for 30 minutes, sometimes 45 minutes. Uh, one day I recall that Julian Mellum and Martin Muzanowski saw only four people all day long, because every appointment lasted for an hour to almost two hours once they began to talk about the Bible to the individual. So these vary substantially, and what we will try to present is just a, an overall outline of what we do, and then I'll tell you some of the response we get. First of all, to give you a little better idea of why we go to those people in civil government with the Word of God, turn to Romans 13, a very well-known passage and very often misunderstood or mistaught. Paul writes, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. And long sermons and books and articles have been written telling the individual Christian that that means you are subject to the government. Whatever the government laws are, you simply obey. Because they say, well, the government is the higher power, and those are ordained of God. In fact, Billy Graham actually used this reference over in the Soviet Union, speaking to the citizens of the Soviet Union, in effect telling them that they should obey the higher powers, the inference being that you should obey your communist masters. Now, does it mean we are subject to every authority that chooses to give us orders, even usurpers who have taken authority over us, which they do not have, such as conquest by a foreign nation, by a foreign army, or something like that? Along with that, some erroneously teach that Christians are not to get involved in government at all, that after all, there is, quote, separation of church and state. Whenever you ask them where that is in the Bible, you're usually met with silence, because, uh, well, I don't know where that is in the Bible. Well, where is it in the Constitution? Well, they don't know where it is in the Constitution either. And I'll tell you where it is. It's in the Soviet Constitution. It states very specifically that there is separation of church and state. And so when these people come to you and say, well, the Constitution says separation of church and state, they very probably are referring to what they consider the Constitution of the world, the Constitution of the USSR. They don't tell you that. They let you think they're talking about your Constitution, and they're not. Now, I'm going to comment on this drawing here a little bit later so that you'll see what I'm talking about as far as the higher power. One of the reasons I'm doing this uh, a secondary reason, actually, is because of the lawsuits that are now being filed against the President, against Congress, against the government itself for making this declaration that came along with 1983 as the year of the Bible. Here is one of the first articles in a paper about this. It was January 8th in 1983, Year of the Bible Unlawful. And what it explains is prior to President Reagan making the declaration they actually went to court and attempted to get a federal judge to put out an injunction or a restraining order to prevent him from doing it. The federal judge refused, and it says here that he couldn't issue it because he didn't know whether Reagan would issue the proclamation or whether it would be unconstitutional. 
so he had to wait until he did it. Well, then later, of course, he did it, and now they are filing the lawsuits attempting to get the declaration itself and the resolution, which is Public Law 97-280 repealed. Many people do not even know that this document was passed by the Congress or signed by the President because the news media has kept rather quiet about this. You people all know about it because I've told you or you've heard it on Christian radio or Christian television. But the public that does not watch Christian radio or Christian television doesn't know about Public Law 97-280, the resolution on this. All right, let's go on in Romans 13. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute, or your taxes, pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Now look at that a little, and then I'll read something that a minister wrote about this, or spoke about this, preached on this subject about 200 years ago. Verse 1. What is the higher powers? Now, most ministers who teach this just leave that blank, and you assume it is government. This chart that I have in front of the pulpit shows the higher powers in the order of their authority in the United States of America. God and His Word is first. Then the people, and the reason the people are second is because it is the people who wrote the Constitution and formed the government. God is supreme because He created the people. The people are supreme over the government because they are the creators of the government. You see, modern theology and modern education has turned this thing upside down, and they put the government up here and the people down here. And this government is formed by we the people, and the only power the government has is that which the people have given it. So the higher power, if they're talking about government, there is a higher power called the people. And then if they're talking about the people, there's another higher power called God Almighty and His Word. So you are subject to government last. In fact, it is the government which is subject to the higher power of what? The Constitution. You see, between the people and the government, there is a Constitution. And the government is subject to that. Now, if there's anything in the system set up here in this Christian republic to which the people are subject to, it would be their own constitution which they wrote to establish government. So the higher power here would be the constitution and those laws written subsequent and under the constitution, not the civil servants who are the employees of the people. And I know this should be explained, and every person who graduates from grade school in America should know that, but they don't. In verse 3, he describes what kind of rulers have some authority over you. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. He's not telling you to be subject to rulers who are a terror to good works. He says, no, they're to be a terror to the evil works. And, of course, that um, ability to be a terror to evil works is prescribed in the Constitution by the people. Verse 4 and verse 6 say they are ministers of God, which is why I say we go as ministers to ministers. When an ordained minister in a church goes to an ordained civil servant, he's talking as minister to minister. Verse 4 says they are ministers to thee for good. They have authority to do that which is good for you. They have no authority to do that which is evil or wicked or brings unjust punishment upon you. Verse 6 says they are to attend continually upon this very thing. What thing? Well, the people's good and to bring wrath upon the evildoer. 
And for practical purposes, that is the only authority any government has is to protect good people and to punish wicked people. Romans 13 is not an exhortation to obey anyone who claims they have authority over you. Most of what the United States government does, much of what the states do, and much of what cities and counties do is not constitutional. They have no authority to do what they're doing. Okay, in verse 7, it says, Render therefore to all their dues, not more than they have coming, but what they have coming. Tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Is God telling you to give honor to dishonorable rulers? Rulers who oppress you and rob you and plunder you? Obviously not. So we see that we have three of these in order, God in his word, then the people, and then the Constitution. Turn with me to John 19, and we'll read just a few verses in the New Scripture, which will give you some idea of this order of power. John 19, verse 10 and 11. Jesus is in the hands of the civil ruler. Pilate is the governor. Verse 10, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Listen to Jesus' answer. Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Civil rulers have no power over anyone, except it's given to them from above. This is not just over Jesus. This is over anyone else. Jesus said, No, I am free under God unless you are given power over me. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. He was neither condemning Pilate or giving Pilate any sovereignty over him. He says, God has given you certain powers over him, and that's what all he had. And, of course, that was done in order to carry out God's word. Turn to Matthew 22. I'm using simply New Testament scriptures for this. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 15. Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might, they might entangle him in his talk. They're trying to trip Jesus up and get him to say something that is wrong. And they sent out unto him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Master, we know that thou art true, and teachest the way of God in truth. Neither carest thou for any man, for thou regardest not the person of men. See, they first praised him and made believe they were on his side. And then they said, Tell us, therefore... What thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? You see, this was a trap. If he said yes, then he would authorize Caesar to be the power, right? If he said no, then they would say, Oh, you're rebelling against the government. Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny or a coin. He saith unto them, Whose is the image and superscription or inscription? They say unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. You don't render Caesar any more than Caesar has. Now isn't it interesting that he did this with a piece of money? And as far back in recorded history as we know, Governments have one major realm of authority, that's in coining the nation's money. And our Constitution states specifically, Congress shall have the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. Now, isn't it interesting that the Congress and the federal government has taken authority to do all sorts of other things, and one of the things we actually gave them authority to do coin money and regulate the value thereof, they don't do. The one authority we gave them, they passed on to a private banking system called the Federal Reserve, and the banks have turned it over to someone completely outside of government. So, do we owe anyone any authority or responsibility in relation to money only Caesar? Now, some of you people who think the tax strikers are wrong, you think about that for a moment. You are dealing not in money from Caesar in America anymore. You're dealing only in money issued by a private corporation, Federal Reserve Banks. But Jesus is pointing out that Caesar does have power in money matters. 
And that's the only thing Jesus admit that Caesar had power in. So you pay tribute where tribute is due, and it's only in money matters, which our government has abdicated their responsibility on that. They have the power to coin money. Now, I want to read from a sermon preached in 1773 about Romans 13. A sermon preached before His Excellency Thomas Hutchinson, Esquire, Governor, the Honorable His Majesty's Council, and the Honorable House of Representatives of the Province of Massachusetts Bay in New England, May 26, 1773. So this sermon was preached by an American Protestant minister to the King's Governor, to the King's Council, and the elected representatives from the colony. This was three years before the Declaration of Independence. The subject of his sermon was Romans 13 and verse 4, He is the minister of God to thee for good. I want to read somewhat of what he said, and we believe this and we act on this, and this is why we go to Washington, D.C., because this is the truth about Romans 13. I'll read part of it. Magistrates that are lawful are appointed of God to be his ministers, but for what purpose? Not to manage the affairs of the world so, so as to increase the felicity of the supreme being, for he is above the possibility of being benefited by the services of men or angels. Not to enslave mankind and involve them in misery and ruin, not surely to enrich and aggrandize themselves and their families, prejudicial to honest industry, as if God had a partiality for them, but he appoints them to be his ministers for the good of the public. A little further down. That the civil ruler and Christian minister should engross the wealth of the world to themselves, as they have done in many countries and ages, and live in pride and luxury on spoils violently extorted or slyly drained from the people, is altogether foreign to the design of God in setting them up. It is his mind that both, acting in character, should be reverenced and honorably provided for, but his grand view in raising them to their places of eminence is that one should do good in religion, the other in civil respects to the world. The Apostle Paul in this letter to Roman Christians says, He, meaning the civil magistrate, is the minister of God to thee for good. The sense of the sacred writer we judge to be that civil magistry is designed of God for good to the governed, and that rulers are therefore eventually his ministers for the promotion of public happiness, considered as understanding and acting up to the requirements of their stations, and so as to answer the end of their investiture. And he goes on for about 10 or 15 minutes on this vein, that civil rulers have no other obligation than to rule for the people's good, period. And that's what Romans 13 is all about. Especially it is incumbent on the civil magistrate to cultivate the sincerest piety in his own breast. A minister of God, and that's what a civil ruler is, a minister of God who has no reverence for that great being whom he is ordained to serve is a perfect prodigy. The perpetual nourishment of godliness in the heart is the indispensable duty of the civil governor for the honor of God, for his own sake, and for the sake of the people. A superlative respect for him whose absolutely disinterested goodness brought the world into being, and who governs it so that his tender mercies are over all his works, a reverence for authority of the Christian legislature, whose precepts in favor of charity, justice, and kindness hold a distinguished place in the New Testament, an engaging regard to his example, who went about doing good as he came down from heaven with the most beneficent purpose, and who condescended to die for the good of the world, together with a deeply impressed sense of eternity, will have an happy and necessary influence into that patriotism, which is the magistrate's indispensable qualification. Sincere piety fills the soul with the tenderest feelings for mankind, and so engages the heart in pursuit of that which is the great end of government. And he goes on in this vein for apparently about 45 minutes to these elected and appointed governors of that colony three years before our, uh, our revolution. And then he ends the very end of the sermon by saying this, Finally, may God grant that henceforth our government may attain the end of majesty, the general happiness, that our officers may be peace, our exactors righteousness, that judgment and not innocent blood may run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream, that this people the branch of the Lord's planting, 
may be all righteous and inherit the land in the uninterrupted enjoyment of freedom, civil and religious, and all the blessings of goodness forever. Amen. So this minister over 200 years ago recognized that God's word stated very specifically that men in civil rule over the people were there for one purpose, for the good and the happiness and the protection of the people, and that was it. That was the end of their service. They had no other authority to do, any, do anything in any other way. In past years, we have given this to congressmen. We didn't this year. Pastor Turner said that to civil rulers 200 years ago, and this, to a great extent, is what we say to these individuals. We tell them why they are there. And, you know, it's surprising. A lot of them simply do not even know that they're there for the good of the people. They think they're there to rule over the people, control them, order them around, see that they come out, they come in and go out according to what the Congress says and so on. They simply do not know their place there. As we go each year, this year there were eight of us, and we travel in pairs as Jesus instructed his disciples. We make some appointments beforehand, and some we make right at the office as we go in. Now, this year, most days, my partner was Troy Anderson, who was the oldest son of Ken and Dottie Anderson, and Troy reached his 14th birthday while we were there. And I would introduce us to the secretary and then to the congressman as we went on into his office. I would explain who we were, why we were there, and that then I would turn over the introduction of the Bible Law Index to Troy. So I'll briefly tell you what I would say to these people, and sometimes it would take perhaps ten minutes, but generally I would tell them that we are ministers and laymen who come down here every year to talk to the congressmen, to tell them that we realize the United States is in trouble on all fronts, from economics to politics to foreign affairs to military and so on, and, Congressman, the reason we're in trouble is because we're not following God's word. We're out of line with the instruction book that came with the planet. We're not doing things right, or things would be turning out right. And we elaborate on that to some extent. Usually, not always, but usually, we will get a positive response, and they'll shake their head, and they'll say, yes, I know that, and they will admit, yes, that is right. We should be doing things according to Bible law. This year, as soon as we would get some sort of a positive response on that, then I would tell them, and of course each man's presentation is a little different, I would tell them, well, Congressman, I've been coming down here every spring for 15 years to tell you people that you should read and study the Bible and use the Bible in your civil office work, in your area of authority as a congressman. Now, in 1983, I'm not coming down here to tell you that Pastor Emery says you should use the Bible for your information and enlightenment in your office. I'm coming down here to remind you that you congressmen have already said you should use the Bible in your work as a congressman, and that's in the resolution you passed in 1982 asking the president or directing the president to name 1983 as the year of the Bible. And I should add here, some of these congressmen didn't even know what this resolution was, I'm sorry to say. Some of the people in the offices didn't know. And I would say that a lot of them did not recognize how important this thing was, which we hope to show you as we go on. But anyway, as I brought up the subject of the resolution, I would just briefly remind them that they, sitting as the representatives of the people, actually passed Public Law 97-280, which states that America needs to read, study, and apply the teachings of the Holy Scripture. So I'm just down here to remind them that they said they need the Holy Bible. And then I would say I have, we have this um, Bible Law Index, and I want Troy Anderson to present this to you. He'll show you what it is, and we'll leave it with you. At which point Troy would get up and come over to the congressman's desk, with the Bible Law Index and present it to the congressman and go through it, which I will now have him do as if he has a congressman sitting here. Okay, what we have here is a Bible Law Index. Now, on the inside page, we have the Public Law 97-280, which is authorizing and requesting the president to proclaim 1983 as the year of the Bible, which he did. 
In this joint resolution, in the first sentence, Congress has declared Bible the Word of God, where it says, whereas the Bible, comma, the Word of God. Now down at the bottom it says, whereas that renewing our knowledge of and faith in God through the Holy Scripture can strengthen us as a nation and a people, now therefore be it. A little bit further down it says we have a national need to study and apply the teachings of the Holy Scriptures. So what we're gonna, what we've done here, Congressman, is we're gonna help you so you can use the Holy Scriptures to your needs in the office and the different bills that come up. And we put a guide to the laws of the Bible. We have the uh, title, subtitle, book, chapter, and verse. Uh, civil authority, citizens and aliens, um, national defense. We have a few pages on the different uh, titles. Now, on the next page, we have a commentary on Congress declaring Bible the Word of God. We have one page on that. And in the next page, we have God's law as a blessing and a curse. It says, A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day. So if we obey God's law, we will get a blessing throughout the land. And if we will not obey God's law, we will get a curse. The next page, America must turn to God's law. 71% of the Bible is on government, and 29% is on personal or personal salvation. Now most of the churches are saying, how can I help you, instead of how can we help the nation? And that's what we've come down here to do. Now, we have some cartoons in relation to man's law to God's law. Now, man's law on theft is he's found guilty of robbing a delivery truck. He's sentenced to 10 years in prison at the citizen's expense. The citizen taxpayer who did not get his truck back, but he has to pay more money to feed this guy in prison. God's law is, as in Exodus 22, he would have to pay up to five delivery trucks. Now, if he didn't have the money to do that, as in, it says in Exodus 22.3, If he, the thief, have nothing, then he, sh he shall be sold for his theft. The judge says that if you cannot pay, you must work to repay Mr. Jones. Work also teaches skills, improves behavior, and reduces the tendency to crime. If he simply refuses, then it says in Deuteronomy 17, and the man that will not hearken unto the priest or unto the judge, even that man shall die. So that's man's law in relation to God's law on theft. Man's law on murder is he goes out and kills the guy. He is sentenced to 10 years in prison. The citizen taxpayer has to pay to feed him in prison the same procedure. God's law is one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. Exodus 21. If you have two to three witnesses, he should be put to death by public execution. A man's law on rape, in relation to God's law on rape, the criminal is found guilty of rape. After so many years, he is released back into society and he rapes another lady. Repetition of rape by former rapists is almost certain, as most are mentally defective. God's law is he's found guilty of rape. God's law says he should be put to death by public execution. And as you can see in the small cartoon at the bottom, you can walk through the park with peace and harmony, and you'd have peace and harmony throughout the land. Deuteronomy 19.20 says, And those which remain shall hear and fear, and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil, among you. So, when those who violate God's law are punished according to God's judgments, the citizens enjoy justice, order, quietness, and peace. In the next page, we have the history of Bible law from Israel to America, and that's a short uh, summary on that. Now, if you flip back to the front, we have a uh, small pamphlet on the Bible law and money. Now, this is on uh, usury, the uh, cancellation of all debts, which is in Leviticus 25, the, uh, the year of Jubilee, every seven years. Uh, stable money, silver and gold, 
It's just a uh, small 10-page pamphlet on one of the Bible laws on money. Now, this small uh, booklet here, The United States of America and Bible Prophecy, this was uh, two sermons preached to U.S. Congress in 1857, 125 years ago. It was preached on Washington's birthday by Reverend Pitts. It was called The United States of America Foretold in the Holy Scriptures. And Congress liked him so much they had him come back the next day, and then he preached the Battle of Armageddon. So this is his full two sermons here. So we'd like to leave all this with you, and hopefully that you'd be able to use it in your study, and your staff could use it too. All right, thank you, Troy. That was a presentation that Troy did over and over in scores of offices, and I was a little concerned about this young man the first time I had him do that to a congressman. And I thought, well, he has to do it to someone. And um, he had already um, presented this to a couple aides before we got in one of the offices where we saw the congressman. And he treated the congressman just as if he was just another person and told him what for. And we did discover this. And this is no reflection on you older people. But these people paid closer attention to him than they did the rest of us. They listened. There was no tapping of their feet, no uh, pounding of their fingers on the desk and nothing. They paid very close attention to everything he said, and they watched, and they went right through the booklet with him and uh, read what he um, was reading because he put it right on the desk by them, which the other men did too, or I did when I presented it to them. And the result was that almost all of the people who were given this then thanked us, many of them very profusely, for bringing in this Bible Law Index that they could use. And, of course, as you can see, it's quite attractive, and they were very pleased to get it. The congressman or the senator who did take the picture with the men, the part of the reason he did that was because he felt they were doing a good work. Over and over, they would tell us they were glad we were there. They thanked us for coming. They wished us good luck, Godspeed, and so on. Anyway, after Troy would finish his presentation, then I would close the conversation by going into a little more detail about the resolution itself. And if you have your copies out there, I want you to take a look at this, because first I would point out to them that I wanted them to read that book. I am sure you're interested in these 125-year-old sermons, and Congressman, you should read that, because this man, 125 years ago, told your predecessors that according to Bible prophecy, America was Israel restored. America was the great regathering of the Israel people, and this nation was the great nation promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this man saw this 125 years ago. Now, he also saw another thing which is in that book, and that is at the end of the age, a conglomeration of nations under Russia would invade the United States of America in the last great battle fought upon the earth. And by then, you can imagine, most of these people, they're just staring at you. They're very uh, taken with this idea that a century and a quarter ago, a minister already told the Congress and the Senate that the United States was Israel. The United States was Israel restored. And many of them say, well, I'll have to read that. And we said we hoped they would. Then I would go back to the resolution to point out to them that after reading this resolution, there are several things that Troy has already told you, that you, congressman, passed a law which states that the Bible is the Word of God. In effect, you have admitted that to the nation and to the world, that the Bible is the Word of God. All arguments are by the board at this point. The law says the Bible is the Word of God. And I don't know whether you understood just what you were doing, perhaps you did, but some of the other men may not have understood that they were speaking for America, and they were speaking to God, and they were saying that the Bible was the foundation of this nation, that this nation grew to greatness on the Bible, and that our future welfare depends on what we do with this Bible, the Word of God. This is not a minister saying this. This is not some church declaration. This is the United States of America, the legally elected representatives of the people in Congress assembled have passed a law that states America's future depends on what we do with the Bible. 
And this is the most powerful, the most scriptural document that has ever been passed by the United States Congress since 1776. And very probably, this is a more biblical and a more important document than the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. And you realize, I'm saying in a few minutes what would often take five or ten minutes, because they would talk back, there'd be conversation, questions, and so on. And then I would very often say to them, I want to tell you of another place, another time in history that you know about. When Israel came out of Egypt and God met them at Mount Sinai, God gave them the Ten Commandments in stone and the law, statutes, and judgments. God gave them to the civil ruler, not the priest. He gave them to government. Moses was the president of the Israel Republic. God gave Moses the laws Moses went to the people, and the people said, All that the Lord has said, we will do. Now, in 1982, the United States of America, the people have spoken through their elected representatives, and they have almost said that. What they have actually said is, All that the Lord God has said, we should do. This is the closest that any nation in modern history has come to making a covenant with the Lord Jesus Christ and God Almighty that we will obey His Word. And, Congressman, whether you know it or not, America has made an agreement with God. America has made a covenant with God in this resolution, and God is going to hold us to it. Then we would have to explain to some of them that we did not know until we arrived in Washington, D.C. this year, that when President Reagan signed the declaration naming 1983 as the year of the Bible, it was done at what was called the National Prayer Breakfast. There were 3,000 people there, and being in Washington, D.C., the people from all of the foreign embassies were invited. And there were delegates at that breakfast from over 120 foreign nations. America has spoken to its people and to God Almighty and to the world that the Bible is the foundation of our nation, the Bible is the reason we grew to greatness, that God has blessed this people above all people upon the face of the earth, and we need to study and apply the teachings of the Holy Scripture. America has made a confession to the world that we need God's Word. This is the most powerful document that has ever come out of the United States of America, as far as I'm concerned, even since our beginnings. There's nothing like it has ever been done, and nothing like it in any modern nation. Now, I want to close with Second Chronicles 7.14, because I'm sure that's come to your mind. We have that in the literature we gave to the congressman. I'm going to read it just the way we reprinted it in there on about the fourth page of your loose-leaf binder. Second Chronicles 7.14 If my people, which are called by my name, the Christians, shall humble themselves, not humble the enemy, but humble themselves, and seek my face, my law, and my will, and turn from their wicked ways, meaning turn from their disobedience to my law, then, after they do that, will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin, forgive their transgression of my law, and will heal their land. Public Law 97-280, which was voted for by the elected representatives of the people and signed into law in this nation, I believe is a step towards America's confession and repentance and turning to God and God healing this land. One of the men with us after we were there a couple days, as we began to realize the fantastic significance of this document, one of the other ministers there with us said, You know, Pastor Emery, he says, This joint resolution by Congress is the beginning of the end of communism's power over America. We have made an agreement with God that we're going to turn and use His Word. Now, I've been preaching national repentance for years. I had nothing whatsoever to do with this document. I didn't even know it had been introduced in Congress until two months after it was passed. The news media didn't tell us. 
But if you will read it and read your Bible and read it with the understanding that the prophecy says a miracle will turn, you'll see that this is a very definite evidence, sign of the time, covenant, whatever you wish to call it, that America is turning back to God. Now, the atheists can cry, they can holler, they can go to court, they can do whatever they want to do. But America has spoken, and America spoke to God and to the world. The Bible is the foundation of this nation. God's word is what we need, and our future welfare depends on what we do with it. It wasn't a minister that said it. It was the elected representatives of the people signed by the highest officer in the land, the President of the United States. Now, I do pray that many of you people will read this and recognize that this is Zion. Turning back to God according to the prophets is taking place right under our eyes, and if we're not careful, we miss it. And there are thousands of people who have been involved in this thing. Hundreds of thousands will know about it. Millions will follow it as God pours out his Spirit upon us because of what our leaders have done. No wonder the enemies of God, the Antichrist, and the atheists are gnashing their teeth over this thing. You read it over. And you just pray that the seed that we sowed in Washington, D.C., and the 250 of these that we left there will be used and will serve God's purpose to edify and instruct these people as God's America, Israel, turns back to God through the spirit and power and blood of Jesus Christ. Our Father and our God, we do thank you and praise your name that these things are coming to pass. Lord God, we've prayed about them, we've spoken of them, we've preached on them, we've hoped for them. And here they come without hardly our knowledge that we have to believe, we have to see that this was your hand working on these men. This was not some human idea or some man's idea. This was done by your spirit and your power. Work